Okay, we're going to start talking about the focus of this discussion is ultimately concurrency frameworks. In order to get there, we're going to have to talk a bit about frameworks um, because concurrency frameworks are a subset of frameworks. So I'm going to first start talking about what frameworks are and how they're used in Android and Java, and then we'll talk about the concurrency stuff. We may just get through the framework overview today, and then we'll pick up with the concurrency stuff next time. So what the heck is a framework? Very, very, very important concept. Surprisingly not well understood, even though we all use them all the time when we write modern programs. It's kind of like parts of speech, right? You know, we're always accustomed to speaking. We, we know how to speak in complete sentences. We can communicate ourselves and our thoughts clearly and concisely. But if you sat down with someone and said, diagram a sentence for me, people might be a bit befuddled if they'd forgotten, you know, subject, verb, predicate, adjective, adverb. Even people who speak perfectly cogent English may have a hard time uh, understanding exactly how to do that. So I'm going to talk about what does it mean to be a framework to give you a better conceptual foundation for all the things that you're already doing. So a framework is an integrated set of components that collaborate to provide a reasonable architecture for a family of related apps or applications. That's the, that's the definition. We'll break that down and explain what that means in a second. Android and Java provide many, many, many frameworks. In fact, the modern software world is absolutely full of frameworks. Here's some examples of frameworks that Android provides. The activity framework, which is used to manage lifecycle hook methods that are dispatched by Android in the user interface thread. And um, we won't talk a ton about that in this course, but just so you'll know, uh, under the hood, when you program with Android, we've got all these hook methods, on create, on start, on stop, on destroy. And they're called at various times in the life cycle of your application's activities. Another example of a framework are the click listeners for button presses. So when you have a user interface in Android and it's got a button and you push that button, then that ends up being invoked as a callback on the GUI framework, and that'll ensure that when you click on the button, the right piece of code is dispatched in order to handle that click. So those are a couple examples of frameworks in Android, and we'll talk more about other stuff shortly. Java also has lots of frameworks, lots and lots and lots and lots of frameworks. Um, one of them you've already played with, of course, is the Java thread framework. So the way it works is when you say new thread, give it a runnable um, dot start, that ends up using the threads framework, which will dispatch the run hook method on the runnable that you gave to the constructor of the thread. So you just have to know how to implement run, and all the other stuff gets taken care of for you behind the scenes. Something else that we've briefly talked about, but we'll go into a lot more detail as we get into the Android Async Task framework, is something called the Executor Service, which is also a framework, and it allows you to submit tasks and those tasks are then run in a thread, in a pool of threads, and it works by dispatching the call hook method of a callable in order to carry out the computation in a background thread. So that's another framework. Every Android app you'll ever write runs inside of one or more frameworks. There's no way around that. Your apps must use many different frameworks. And if you start getting more into Android than we're going to get into in this course, but if you take my MOOC, for example, on Android, or you get into more advanced forms of Android, you'll see that there's lots and lots of other frameworks. So we've got a framework to manage the windowing system, framework to handle uh, location services, framework to deal with the, the telephone, the radio, framework to handle uh, downloading new apps from the app, from the Play Store, framework for notifying in your notification status bar when things have happened in the background, frameworks to manage the life type cycle of activities and services and so on and so forth. Lots and lots and lots of frameworks are all working together to provide you Android. Why do we do this? So what's the reason? Why is this so popular? Basically comes down to so-called systematic software reuse, which is the intentional reuse of software. Um, back in the day, in fact, you may have done this yourself if you've worked on programming projects that are any length of size or any length of time, there's also opportunistic reuse, where you cut and paste stuff you did before and reuse it. And while that's certainly time-honored and 
uh, one way to do things, it's got limitations because it's not very intentional. So systematic reuse is much more intentional. By doing this, you allow apps and application developers to avoid having to reinvent the wheel. And the, the downside with reinventing the wheel is trying to not reinvent a square wheel, right? You want to invent the wheel so it rolls and it's got the right properties. So frameworks allow you to avoid reinventing the wheel. And Android frameworks, like many, many frameworks, use a so-called event-driven programming model to integrate application code into the framework. And the, the analogy I like to think about here is sort of an iceberg, if you will, where only the tip of the iceberg is above water. That's all you see. That's like your app code. And then underneath is looming the giant part, which is what all is provided to you. So in an event-driven model, the flow of control through the program, right, if you're writing Android code or other code, is in terms of callbacks, which are triggered when certain events happen. And those events include things like user actions, the users pressing on virtual buttons, input from sensors or other sources of I.O., like the network and so on, and messages that come in from other threads. These are some of the sources of input that are represented as events and are driven by callbacks through an event-driven mechanism. So this is kind of what it looks like at a, at a top level, the control flow in a framework in, in Android and just about anything else. Uh, it involves uh, interactions between the framework code that's provided for you and code that you write. And this is typically what it looks like. So on the left-hand side in blue, we see the application code. And on the right-hand side, we see the framework code. Remember, there's a lot more framework code typically than application code. So we come along, we create something in Android. We, we might make an activity or a service or a broadcast receiver or a content provider, which was the discussion of last week. And then we register that entity for one or more events. And this is typically done implicitly. Like when you create an activity, it's done for you automatically. And then the framework is responsible for detecting when those events occur. So like, you know, a user presses a button or an activity comes into existence or it's about to go uh, and be occluded and, and no longer visible on the screen. You know, whatever the events are, the framework detects that and then calls back to the application code to handle it somehow. The framework knows something happens, but it probably has no earthly idea what to do with the thing that just happened. So it says, all right, I know that an activity just got created, or I know that a new message just showed up, or I know that um, something crashed, or whatever. Go figure out what to do with that. And so that calls back to the application code, and it, that's typically done in Android by dispatching these so-called hook methods, like on start, on receive, on create, or whatnot. The application code does its thing in the context of the callback thread, which is usually provided by the framework. In this case, it's, it's almost always the user interface thread, which is provided by the framework. Once the application code is done, control returns back to the framework, which then repeats this process indefinitely. So it does lather, rinse, repeat until the application is finished. All right, that's the basic flow of control in an event-driven program. And by separating concerns in this manner, we get to reuse all this software that comes out of the box for you in the form of all the gazillions of lines of framework code and a framework classes. And then you just have to fill in the blanks with the stuff that differs what you're doing for a specific application. And even that is often very similar as well. So when we talked last, we've been going over Android frameworks. And I talked a bit about uh, what a framework was in general. What we're going to do now is talk about some of the key characteristics of Android frameworks. Obviously, a lot of what I'll be describing is also relevant for other kind of frameworks, but we're going to focus on Android. So what are some of the key characteristics of Android frameworks? Like all frameworks, Android frameworks are characterized by three primary characteristics. Number one, they have something called inversion of control by, by a callbacks. And what this means is that the framework controls the main thread or threads of execution. So the the framework has the thread of control for the most part. And when something happens, like an event shows up, it's the framework that decides 
what to do with that event and when and how to run application code in response to the event. So it's the framework that's doing that decision making. So the contrast to this would be self-directed applications where the application decides what to do. In the case of Android, the framework decides what to do. This is sometimes called the, this inversion of control concept is sometimes called the Hollywood principle, which you can read about here at this link. And uh, basically the Hollywood principle says, don't call us, we'll call you. Um, this was probably funnier in the days bef before Harvey Weinstein and so on. But uh, the idea was that you know, the movie Moogles, Steven Spielberg and so on, would call you, you wouldn't call them. So it's a callback-like model. For example, in Android, there's something called the looper, which sits there and waits for events to show up from various sources like button presses or clicks or network events or whatnot. And that looper dispatches a handler and that handler then goes ahead and dispatches a runnable to do the application specific response to the event that's occurred that was detected and dispatched by the framework. So that's the inversion of control concept. When a runnable or whatever, some activity is dispatched by, by the Android frameworks, it doesn't know, doesn't care how it got dispatched, it just knows it was called back. So it's not the application component's responsibility to really know the details of how it occurred, it just knows somebody called me back, I've got to do something in response. So that's one of the characteristics of a framework as embodied in Android. Another characteristic of a framework is that it basically integrates domain-specific structure and functionality. So what the heck does that mean? So what it means is that there's capabilities that the framework provides that can be reused in one or more domains. And whenever you start looking at a software domain, we'll talk about what a domain means here in a second, it means that you can have certain structures, in other words, relationships between classes and certain functionality, certain built-in pre-baked capability that doesn't have to be re-implemented by the application developer. So this can be reused. And of course, that's the beauty of Android and frameworks is this massive amount of systematic reuse. So clearly in Android, the focus of Android frameworks are on domains that are associated with mobile apps and services. So Android's not worrying about you know, supercomputing, Android's not worrying about flying airplanes or whatnot, it's worried about the domain of mobile apps and services. So all the kinds of things that it provides are there to facilitate those mobile apps and services. And we've talked about some of those things before, things like location service, telephony service, window management service, notification service, activity and service management, all that kind of stuff. Those are examples of the structures and functionality that's provided out of the box by Android. And this basically allows us to be able to enable or it allows us to be able to have systematic reuse. So we can systematically reuse all these framework components. So whatever app you build that does whatever your application specific functionality you want to provide, there's lots and lots of stuff coming from Android to help you. And then the third thing it provides is so-called semi-complete apps or semi-complete portions of apps where you basically plug in your app code and the framework then calls you back. And the specific way it does this, and we'll see this over and over again with frameworks, is through the use of so-called hook methods. You can read about hook methods here. Hook methods are essentially something that comes from patterns like the template method pattern or the strategy pattern that you've probably learned about in other classes. And they essentially customize the reusable framework classes to run application-specific logic. So if you think about it, the framework's responsible for detecting when events occur, for figuring out which handlers get called back in response to those events, dispatching those handlers, that's all that reusable stuff. But the framework doesn't know specifically what your application's trying to do. You know what your application is supposed to do, and the hook methods are the means by which you configure the framework and customize it to do your thing. If you didn't have that ability, you wouldn't be able to, to do an, an application that was specific for your needs. You just have reusable code that wouldn't help you very much. So what the hook methods do is they help us mediate the interactions between the common abstract classes and interfaces and then the variable parts that are the things that you subclass and, and override the methods. So it basically is helping to connect those two things together. For example, we have something like a runnable, which is a generic abstract class with a well-defined hook method called run, 
and you implement Runnable, either directly or indirectly, and then Android or whatever, whatever framework's available, then ensures that that Runnable's run method gets called back at the right point in time. Okay, so that's a quick overview of Android Framework. So at this point, we've talked about what a framework is, and I've given you some examples of characteristics of frameworks, namely inversion of control, integration of domain-specific structure and functionality, and semi-complete portions of apps. Those are the three defining characteristics of a framework.